My wife called her mom and said, he fought with me again. I'm coming home to stay with you. Her mother replied, no, dear. He must pay for his mistakes. I'm coming to stay with you. <laughs> One guy said, I discovered my mother-in-law has weekly sessions with the devil himself on how to be even more vicious. I have no idea what kind of fees she's charging him. <laughs> so many mother-in-law jokes, so little time. <laughs> Most pastors have more sense than to use such humor on Mother's Day. My mother-in-law would have chuckled at those jokes. Of course, then she would have told me that it was totally inappropriate. Her name was Brana. Brana and I got along very well. She was much easier on me than she was on her four children. I think it was because she thought there was still hope for them. <laughs> when I drove from West Palm Beach to Fort Myers to meet Yvonne's family for the first time, I was in college and I had a full beard. Brana was not impressed with me or my beard. Later, she asked Yvonne, where did you find him? She assumed I had crawled out from under a rock or I had been living in some dark alley in a cardboard box. Plus, I was Baptist. <laughs> Against her mother's better judgment, Yvonne married me and Brana became my mother-in-law and she was good to me. Like Naomi and many of us, Brana knew her share of grief. Her father died suddenly at a young age, which made it difficult for her mother and the three girls. She grew up without much in Fort Meade, Florida. She struggled with depression. She lost her mother in 83, and in 1998, her husband died. Her son, Lynn, who also struggled with depression, died by suicide. Her Alzheimer's made it so that she didn't quite comprehend his death, which in a twisted way was a blessing. And for her sake, I'm grateful that she passed before her only two grandsons died months after she did. Many of you have experienced grief. You know what it is like to be completely devastated by loss, to feel like your heart is fragmented into a million shards of broken glass. You think you'll never be whole again, never feel normal again. Naomi and her husband Elimelech took their two sons and left their home in Bethlehem because there was no food there. The family left the security and familiarity of their homeland and their hometown. They traveled to Moab so they could find food. Then Elimelech died, leaving Naomi to raise two sons as a widow in a foreign country. It is a testament to Naomi's grit, determination, and love for her sons that she found two wonderful young women, Orpah and Ruth, for her sons to marry. Remember, parents arranged marriages in those days. Then her sons died. What harder loss is there for a mother or a father to bear than to lose a child? Naomi lost both her sons. In that patriarchal culture, the daughters-in-law had left their families and become part of Naomi's family. Now, they were all that she had left. The three widows grieved their shared losses. Naomi struggled with the overwhelming grief of losing both sons on top of losing her husband. Many of you have experienced more than one loss. When we experience a new loss, it resurrects the pain of the previous losses. Each grief gets piled on the others. The pain of grief is cumulative. When Naomi grieved her son's death, she was also grieving her husband's death all over again. One way to cope with grief is to remember the good times. Did her mind go back to Bethlehem to when her boys were small and playing with her, their father? Did she remember scenes of them all laughing together and having a good time before the famine? As grief weighed her down, was she trying to cling to the memories of happy times 
before they nearly starved, before they became refugees in Moab, and before all her men died. As tears of sadness flowed from her shattered soul, did she remember the sound of her boys giggling in the bed or the feel of her husband's embrace? Was that the reason she decided to go back to Bethlehem? Maybe if she went home, she'd find healing for her broken heart. Or perhaps it was a more practical decision. A middle-aged immigrant widow, Naomi, had no hope of making a living in Moab. In that patriarchal world, widows had to rely on sons. If a widow had no sons, she had to turn to prostitution or sell herself as a slave. Naomi learned that the famine was over at home, so she packed her little bag and told her daughters-in-law she had to go home. Both young women insisted on going to Judah with her, but Naomi knew their chances of making it depended on them having a husband. That would be unlikely if they went with Naomi because of the bias in Judah against immigrants, and especially immigrants from Moab. Naomi assumed they would have better chances of getting married again in, in their own country. Orpah and Ruth, Ruth would be better off going back to their families. Naomi had seen what good wives these young women were to her sons. She knew they cared for her in her grief. They would make fine wives for other men. She believed in them. She told them she had confidence in them. Having someone believe in you is so important. We need to remember that when dealing with sons or daughters or sons-in-law or daughters-in-law. We can encourage them and let, let them know that we believe in them. Naomi loved her daughters-in-law and wanted what was best for them. Staying in Moab would have been in their best interest, but Orpah and Ruth decided to go with her. Why were these three widows so committed to each other? As King Duncan points out, their love was forged in the furnace of grief. When someone you love suffers a loss with you, when you walk the path of grief, grief together, you, your souls can be welded together at the deepest level. Some of you are bound to friends and family because of the tragedies that you have suffered together. Yes, the opposite can happen. Sometimes grief can splinter families and destroy relationships. The last I read, more than 80% of couples who lose a child end up divorcing. Grief is tough, but love can also be tempered and strengthened in the fire of loss. Ruth found it possible, impossible rather, to break away from Naomi. She, her soul was welded together with Naomi's. Naomi made it clear that there was no hope for, their for her daughters-in-law to find husbands with her. Finally, Orpah decided that her mother-in-law was right, and so she decided to go back to her family, back to her own country. Ruth, however, was committed to Naomi. Ruth loved Naomi deeply. It was in this context that Ruth spoke some of the most famous words in all of literature. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. The story of Ruth and Naomi demonstrates what love is all about. Love is about loyalty, faithfulness, kindness, and devotion in the midst of heartache and hardship. Ruth's beautiful affirmation to Naomi reminds us of Jesus' statements, I will never leave you or forsake you, and I will always be with you even until the end of the ages. That's love, isn't it? It's not, I love you for what I can get from you, or I'll love you as long as it feels good or while it's convenient. 
No, it's I'll love you no matter what. I'll always be there. No wonder Ruth's words are often quoted at weddings. Ruth was committed to her mother-in-law in the trauma of their grief, even when there was nothing for her to gain and everything to lose. So these two women set out for Bethlehem. Naomi's relatives greeted her fondly as she entered the city, but she told them, don't call me Naomi. Naomi means sweetness or pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, for my life has been a bitter one. The only food Naomi and Ruth had to eat was what the farmers left in the fields after their harvest. The system was known as gleaning. Farmers were not permitted to go back over their fields a second time. Whatever was left from the first harvest was for the widows and the poor. Apparently, Naomi was so devastated by grief, she could not glean in the fields. So Ruth gleaned enough for both of them. Ruth's love for her mother-in-law mirrors God's love for us. It is a love that never quits, never gives up, never fails, never runs out. It's the love from the heart of God. I'll always be with you no matter what. I'll always be there for you. And you and I are recipients of God's love and grace. We hang crosses in our sanctuaries and around our necks to remind us of that love. Christ Jesus laid down his life for us so that we may come to know God's sacrificial love and learn how to love one another that way. Over the past 2,000 years, people like us have experienced that love in Christ and have passed it on to others through plagues and famines, oftentimes under barbaric oppression, God's love has never let us go. There's a Hebrew word that describes God's love for us. It's a hard word to translate in English, chesed. Translations vary widely using phrases like covenant faithfulness, loving loyalty, loving kindness. It's a combination of loyalty, grace, faithfulness, kindness, and love. Chesed is not so much an emotion as it is an action. Ruth embodied chesed. Her love for her mother-in-law reminds us of God's loyal love for all of us, a love that never ends. And we are challenged by our Lord to love each other that way. By the way, the story of Naomi and Ruth has a wonderful, happy ending. The ending could almost be spelled out like, and they lived happily ever after, which is sort of rare in the Bible. But I encourage you to read the whole story. Robert Munch wrote the beautiful little children's book, Love You Forever. It begins, a mother held her new baby and very slowly rocked him back and forth back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. When the little boy was two and driving her crazy, every night she still rocked him and sang the song to him after he fell asleep. And still when he was nine years old and refused to take baths, and even when he was a strange acting teenage teenager. She continued to sing to him in his sleep as she rocked him. When the boy grew up to be a man, his mother would drive across town and hold him and rock him in his sleep, singing the same song, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. When she was too old and too sick to sing this song, her son took her in his arms and rocked her and sang this song to his mom. I love you forever. I like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Then he went home, picked up his baby daughter, rocked her and sang his mom's song to her. The Lord's love for us is like that of a mother's. Ever since you were born, every night as you slept, 
God has been singing that song to you. I love you forever. I like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. God's love for us is eternal because God is eternal. Thanks be to God for the love the Lord has shown us and the love to which God calls all of us. Amen.